Hey everybody, um, welcome to part three of our World War One series. Um, if you have not seen parts one or part two, recommend you go back and watch those. Um, but for those of you who don't care about context or finding out what happened in the Western Front, welcome. Privet tovarish, welcome to Rearview. Uh, if you enjoy what we do, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, you can follow everything that we do at Eche Records. You can follow this show right here at Rearview Show on all social media platforms. And to keep up to date with everything that we do, go to echemedia.net. Please share. Um, like, send this video to five friends that you think would like it. That would mean a lot to us. Uh, today, we will be looking at the most undertaught aspect of World War One. It's a part of the war that really doesn't get any attention in most high school history classes and even in some college courses on the world wars. It's hardly ever studied. Um, that being the Eastern Front. Um, this front, uh, interestingly enough, has a bit of a racial component to it that the other that the Western Front doesn't have. Um, and it's really where old rivalries of Teuton and Slav start to get settled. Revolution and reaction intersect, I mean, explicitly here. Um, and uh, by the end of this, the world is forever changed. Um, and the old world is, I mean, killed. Doesn't even begin to describe it. It's more like viciously murdered and then its body is burned as sacrifice on the altar of progressivism yeah this is going to be a hot episode folks hold on tight um but i would be remiss if i didn't mention our lovely producer andy um hello this unfortunately will be andy's final episode of rear view um which he is really excited about because he wants to just listen to the show instead of having me yell at him about slides <laughs> um but we wish him the best and he's going to be in our prayers and always in our thoughts um so yeah but that being said before we can jump into the eastern front we need a little context and for this one we're gonna go way back because in addition to looking at the Eastern Front, we're also going to be looking at the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. Yes, those are two separate things. Learn yourself some history today on Rearview. Um, and so we're going to go all the way back to Tsar Alexander II, pictured right here. Um, he is known as the Tsar Liberator. He was the Tsar that emancipated the serfs and... Um, was really quite the reformer, especially given how reactionary Russian politics were at this time. N he was not a liberal, but he was willing to teach reading in schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sounds like a lib to me. Right, yeah. The, the Russian reformers are very interesting because, you know, like at the same time, well, almost at the same time, there are reforms going on in the United States and they're all like business reforms and political reforms and things like that. Meanwhile, the Russians were like, Hmm, I think we should build schools. That might be a good idea. <laughs> um, cause initially most schools were only for, uh, seminaries. Um, so that's why, uh, like everybody makes a big deal out of Joseph Stalin being a seminarian, but, no one really thinks that he was testing his vocation. Uh, it's mostly because he wanted to learn how to read, <laughs> um, which I don't really blame him, you know. But anyway, we're not talking about. You the... don't blame Stalin at all. <laughs> at all, he didn't do anything wrong. He's he just, just misunderstood. He just wanted to learn how to read. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time he was just looking for somebody to teach him how to read. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, Tsar Alexander the Second is also in charge of a massive empire. Can you pull up the uh, empire, please? Look at that, dude. Mm. Huge. To quote the late, great Billy Fusillo of central New York. <laughs> uh, rest right. in peace. Um, he sold used cars. I, okay, total sidebar. But look up uh, Billy Fusillo, huge. <laughs> How do you spell his name? F 
No, F U. Yep. He talks to God? A jingle, a slogan, a logo. <laughs> all things. Oh, no, I don't want to. No, this is in, No, this is death. Oh, yeah. I don't want to watch this. like you. Don't like you. Yeah, Love him or hate him, Billy Fusilla was unapologetically <laughs> polarizing. And even his commercial sidekicks became household names. I've been doing this for 40 years, and this is the biggest promotion that I've ever done. Fusillo and Caroline used, burst onto the scene. He was a used scene. car salesman in central New York, <laughs> and he would always say, it's going to be huge. His Cape Coral Kia dealership, yeah. number one. Zemp- Fluke one day, I was doing a commercial. <laughs> All right, he died. Yeah, sorry. Rest in peace. Yes, may God smile upon you and usher you into his heavenly embrace. Anyway, back to Russia. <laughs> Can you pull up the map again, please? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll try. Um, yeah, so uh, it's the Russian Empire, we don't really appreciate how big it really was. I'm pretty sure in terms of continuous land, it was the largest empire to ever exist. Um, continuous. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, obviously, oh, the Portuguese, ah, oh, the Spanish, ah, oh, the English. Yes, gigantic empires, but there were oceans and different colonies in between the russians just kept growing (laughs) like they just kept getting bigger and bigger um we can see all the way to the west sorry (laughs) um they pretty much touched germany uh eastern prussia and then all the way to the west obviously to alaska um but they didn't did they ever have alaska yeah yeah yeah. they sold alaska to us nice yeah yeah yeah. um and way 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 down in the south kazakhstan turkmenistan all of the stands were owned by russia um as we can see here azerbaijan um a lot of the caucuses almost all the way down into afghanistan um and manchuria interestingly enough near the korean peninsula in northern china that's Mm. gonna come back Mm. uh later um So he's in charge of this gigantic um, empire. And also under Tsar Alexander II, there was a massive influx of Russian art. This is when we start to see the beginnings of Russian literature, um, uh, Russian poems, Russian... The Russian realism movement was going on in the visual arts. Um, Really, I mean, just a real epoch-making moment in Russian history. Unfortunately, this would all come crashing down to an end um, when the Tsar was ultimately assassinated by a group that went by the name of the People's Will. Um, There's a lithograph of what happened here. Um, Basically, they just ran up to him with a bomb and blew him up. And I know what you're thinking. Why would they assassinate such a reformer? You know, like one of the first reforming Tsars who even flirted with not being an autocrat. He still was very much an autocrat, but flirted with it. Um, It's the real, the big thing was a lot of Russians wanted a constitution. Uh, They were states within the Russian empire that had constitutions, most notably Poland. And I mean, the Russians barely viewed the Poles as humans. So they were like, come, they have a constitution and we don't, (laughs) what? Um, And so there was a, a huge, huge push for a constitution some even say that on the day that he was killed he was on his way to like start writing the constitution um there's not really any evidence of that but he definitely was open to the idea however in true russian fashion he was just moving way too slowly also the emancipation of the serfs was not as popular as he thought it was going to be because basically the serfs have wanted you know, people have been pushing for their emancipation for almost 200 years at this point. So it very much was too little, too late. A third of the population lived in serfdom at the time, which is huge for the 19th century. I mean, that's gigantic. And they, um, and the issue became once they were emancipated, what do they do now? They kind of want to stay where they live, but now they have to buy the land or lease it from their previous owners owners masters i guess yeah yeah um yeah and 
and those landlords are not very happy that they lost, you yeah. know, essentially free labor. It wasn't quite free labor, um, but pretty darn close to it. Um, and so there was a big push for land reform and things like that, which was not going to happen. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, he was assassinated by the people's will. One of the coolest names for a revolutionary organization. <laughs> um and uh, so, yeah, this was how it started. But the next picture is uh, how it ended up for them. Uh, <laughs> all of them, all of the conspirators were hung. And if you'll notice there, there's a woman uh, mm -hmm. in the center. Mm -hmm. And she was, I'm forgetting her name, but she was the leader of the people's will. And in true revolutionary fact, did you just pick your teeth with a knife? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty metal. I don't um, have I don't have anything else to do with. <laughs> what do you want? This is the most. There's 80. been something something stuck in my teeth for like the last like day. I <laughs> wow. keep forgetting to do something about it. <laughs> I keep forgetting my knife places. And now I'm just sitting here looking at a bunch of priests killing people. <laughs> yeah. Well, the priests Which aren't doing cool. the killing. The priests are doing the absolution. <laughs> um, they were a group of anarchists, and the girl in the middle, in typical revolutionary fashion, came from a very bourgeois aristocratic family who was and she was just really mad at her dad yeah and uh, i i doubt you'll know but are th those are signs around their necks yeah is that what they did maybe i just wonder full disclosure this is a piece of art that i just ripped off of wikimedia commons I, I, I know. Uh, so <laughs> i just looked up the people's will and this is what came up um probably it's what they did or what they're sentenced to yeah. or it's something like god have mercy or something like that yeah. um That's cool. yeah um as you can see one of the guys is kissing the crucifix uh mm. seeking repentance before his death that's great um uh, also, oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. Prior to Tsar Alexander II's assassination, um, there was what's known as the Russo-Turkish War in 1877. And out of this, Turkey, obviously, fight, well, the Ottomans, I should say, fighting Russia. And out of this comes a lot of countries, most notably Serbia. So this was the basis for the Serb russian alliance that ultimately plays itself out in world war one it also was the basis for turkey or excuse me the ottomans being members of the central powers with germany and austria hungary because mm. they knew they weren't going to be friends with russia because they freaking hated each other at this time um so after czar alexander the second we have Tsar Alexander the Third. Oh, sorry, more stuff. <laughs> um, like I said, the most ADHD episode. Um, uh, on the place of where Tsar Alexander the Second was assassinated, there is now a church, um, the Church of Our Savior Jesus Christ upon spilled blood. A uh, beautiful church. That's very, awesome. very, very beautiful church. Super Russian. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Like honestly, hot take. I like it more than Saint Basil's. Wait, I don't know what St. Basil's looks like. It's like the stereotypical Russian cathedral. It's not the Kremlin, right? <laughs> no, people mistake Ooh. it for the Kremlin. Ooh. Yeah. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really nice. I like but, the other one more. Yeah, the other one looks kind of nice. It's too colorful. Yeah. I like, there's more of like a coherent theme. Yeah. With the blues, greens, and yellows. I like it a lot. Um... So, after Tsar Alexander II, we have Tsar Alexander III. I want you to look this man in the eyes and tell me if you think he's interested in reform. <laughs> no, he is not. One of the first things that he published after his coronation is called The Manifesto on Unshakable Autocracy. Um, sending a very clear and pre and poignant message that yeah all those reforms that my dad did they led to him being assassinated so you guys ain't getting that <laughs> and um it what he immediately was like screw this liberal nonsense we're going back to old russia so all of the reforms are immediately halted um most notably education reform is ceases essentially um and also, he starts to give free reign to a group known as the Ochrenka, 
or the Tsarist secret police, um, which we have a, their sigil right here. Yeah. Huh? It's also, it's also the seal of the Romanov family, but it was essentially their badge to crush any subversive behavior. Um, and it was, I mean, they went after everybody. And what's interesting is this is a theme we're going to come back to later in the, uh, Russian civil war episodes, but, um, the the difference between the czars and the soviets really is just intensity so for example the czars during this period began exiling people to siberia to work camps they weren't as inhumane as the gulags but they were essentially the same thing um the czars institute uh internal migration meaning that you need a passport to go to certain regions of your own country. The Bolsheviks would also do that. And similarly, the Bolsheviks had a secret police, the Tsarists also. Um, Granted, again, the the commies just took any moral, you know, beliefs that the Tsars would have had and chucked them right out the window. Mm. Much more intense, much more willing to violate your freedom and your dignity as a person. Um, but the czar still had it. A lot of people try to cast, um, late stage czarism as like a, Oh, what if Mm. it really wasn't good? I mean, the Romanovs had been in power for over 300 years. Um, and they essentially were the only ruling family in Russian history. Um, it, you know, like while Ivan the terrible and people like that weren't strictly Romanovs, beginning with peter the great which essentially is the start of russia as a modern state it's all romanovs top down and similar to the habsburgs they had really begun to decay on the inside and were really holding on to power with two hands white knuckled just like come on we're gonna weather the storm and uh the okranka is cracking down on everybody and everything most notably Fyodor Dostoevsky is exiled because he's considered too subversive you know so I mean anything that smelled liberal was gone but it made him into a Christian so it worked in his case yeah sometimes it works for the best Get awesome books yeah Thanks. I had I had a uh, a Russian Orthodox Latin teacher I know that that's an oxymoron but uh <laughs> He was always just like, you know, sometimes the unintended consequences of the czars, they were uh, beneficial. (laughs) Like, this guy loved the czars, and I don't blame him. He's Russian Orthodox. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, he just, like, I mean, he pretty, he essentially believed in, like, the mandate of heaven. Like, the Chinese concept, but for (laughs) the Russian czars. Um, Leading the Okranka and being kind of like the legal advice for, well, essentially his right-hand man uh, for Tsar Alexander III was a man by the name of Pyotr Stalipin, uh, pictured right here. He, I mean, look, look at, again, look him in the eyes and tell me this doesn't look like a Russian KGB agent, but just like 50 years before they existed. (laughs) You know, he looks like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in fact, they begin to call the hangman's noose Stalipin's necktie, <laughs> which it's something that I love about the Russians is their use of language is so bitter, but the same way that like a beer is bitter where you're like, mm, I like this. Mm, yeah, it tastes yeah, yeah. good on the lips. Yeah. Um, Cause they just have this like dark, like, oh, it's Stalipin's necktie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and most notably, one of the victims of the Okranka and Pyotr Stalipin was Lenin's brother. Huh. And um, it's believed that that was the event that radicalized Lenin against the Tsars. We're going to talk about Lenin more later. Um, but for most of his life, he was just a normal dude. And then his brother went to university. His brother got involved in subversive behaviors and was hung and lenin was pretty much like oh okay i know who my enemies are um uh czar alexander the third dies somewhat rather suddenly uh on the throne uh of natural causes 
and replacing him is his son, Tsar Nicholas II. Um, we've talked about him a lot. Well, not a lot, a little bit already. Um, like I mentioned in the first episode of the World War One series, check it out right now at Shea Media YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, he very much was very young, very inexperienced. Um, his The advisors of the court said, I wish we had a boy czar um, because then he would have a regent and so he could mature in office. But unfortunately, he was too old to have a regent but too young to really know anything. And really, he inherits a lot of the programs and ideals and advisors and aides that his father had. Unfortunately, they are drastically different men. Tsar Alexander III was committed, had a clear focus, knew exactly what he wanted to do, and he was going to rule as an autocrat. What he said was the law. Tsar Alexander II is very tepid. He's very indecisive. He very much really just kind of loves his wife and his kids. And yeah, he looks like a good boy. He is a very good boy. That's and nice. it's something that makes me really sad um, is that uh, in a lot of history books, he's treated kind of like a retard. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, he was such a moron. Why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? He was just like a really meek guy, hmm. you know, and like in the, the biblical sense of meek. Like, he wasn't really a coward. but he, However, he was indecisive, which is a problem, and it's kind of effeminate. Um, but he really had a very strong devotion to his wife and to his family. Um, most notably, um, I tried to go the whole episode without talking about him, but he really <laughs> falls prey of Rasputin. And here's the thing. 98% <laughs> of the stories you hear about Rasputin are not true. They're complete fabrications by the whites. We'll talk about the whites later. Um, but the whites were a revolutionary force inside of Russia. Um, yes, they were revolutionaries. A lot of people don't understand that, but they were. Um, and so they made up a lot of this stuff about Rasputin sleeping with Tsarina Alexandra and him being possessed and him, you know, the famous story of his death. Oh, they tried to poison him. Oh, and then they shot him. Oh, then they beat him to death. Oh, and then when they threw him in the river, his body crawled out of the ice. All that crap is made up. Like, almost all of it. And it really kind of drives me insane. Because, like, very good historians still repeat it. And it's like, it's, it's basically the same as repeating the myths about Marie Antoinette. It, it was all made up in revolutionary fervor. You know, Marie Antoinette never said, let them eat cake. She, she just didn't. You know, and she wasn't sleeping around with the court the same way that uh, Tsarina Alexandra was not sleeping around with the, with Tsar Alexander II's court. You know, so sometimes we believe the propaganda because we want to. Um, but no, Rasputin isn't, he didn't even get a slide. He's that unimportant to me. He was a faith healer. The Tsar, the Tsarist family was desperate to heal their hemophiliac son, Alexei. Um, and so they were looking for everything, and they thought that some crazy Siberian mystic was the guy to do it. He did have a big influence on him. However, it wasn't uh, puppet master mm -hmm. demonic. Yeah. You know? As he was just indecisive. And unfortunately, when he was, when Tsar Nicholas II was decisive, it was because of the worst influences of his advisors most notably their entry into World War I, which was very avoidable. We're going to talk about that later. But before then, we have some more embarrassment to go through. Um, in 1900, uh, as again, as a hold, because of the holdover programs, uh, Tsar Nicholas II sends troops to the Manchuria region of China. The only problem is it's northern China, and they're, they're looking at the Korean Peninsula, and they're licking their lips. Um, we have a map right here. Spoiler alert, we're talking about the Russo-Japanese <laughs> War. Um, and they're really starting to look at Korea. They're like, ooh, mm. that would be one tasty peninsula you got there. No offense against um, the Koreans, but why do they want Korea? Uh, more land, Just warm water port, uh, 
Because, I mean, the Russians have been looking for a warm water port since there's been oh. a Russia. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they also, <laughs> also, if you'll notice by the X on that map, one of the X's in that uh, near Port Arthur, um, they already had a naval base in China. So they were like, why don't we just expand to Korea? Mm-hmm. And then they probably, I don't have any evidence of this, but my guess is that they were probably going to invade Japan. Yeah. Um, Japan, they thought, was in a downslide at the time. The opposite was true. Japan was actually, like, going to be awesome. <laughs> like, like they were, like... an anime, like, 60 years later. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not what made them awesome. That's what you meant, right? <laughs> yes. But also, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, it ends in Vladivostok, which is uh, on the map as well. Um, so they probably just wanted to connect more railways. Yeah. They spent a lot of money on the trans-siberian railway longest railway in the world you can ride it today it's on my uh bucket list to go on i'll it. go do that with you that'd be dude fun. that would be awesome i love siberia siberia is one of the few places on earth that i just love for no reason <laughs> i want to live there okay well here's the interesting thing about siberia since they exile since both the czars and the soviets exiled so many people there who were like artists or actors or authors um siberia has like nothingness Mm -hmm. and then like very bougie paris-esque art towns where everybody smokes cigarettes outside of cafes yeah dude siberia in the summer is very nice if you can survive the mosquitoes yeah that's the thing Um, is mosquitoes you have to rub mud all over yourself (laughs) there's a documentary about siberia and that's what they do (laughs) okay that's I was awesome. going to say, that was way too specific. <laughs> um, Werner Herzog made this. It's incredible. Uh, Werner Herzog. <laughs> um, so, the Japanese were not too happy with the troops of in Manchuria because they also wanted the Korean Peninsula because Japan always wants two things, Korea and China. <laughs> um, and China <laughs> is in a massive downslide right now. They're dealing with their last dynasty the West is just carving it up. You know, they're just like, hey, who wants pieces of China? We got chunks of China here. You want a port? We got ports. You know, this is during the English occupation, the French occupation. Mm. The Germans had parts of it. The Russians had Port Arthur. I mean, everybody's wow. taking bits out of China. Um, and so Japan, in their attempt, they're going through the... Uh, Meiji restoration right now they're kind of at the tail end of it and they're starting to lick their lips they want the respect of the whole world and so they launch an attack on Port Arthur in um, China specifically they attack the Russian boats there and Tsar Nicholas II says guys hear me out what if we send the Baltic fleet from St. Peter's Excuse me, from St. Petersburg, all the way down Europe, all the way around Africa, all the way through Indonesia, and then meet the Japanese in the Sea of Japan. I, for the life of me, cannot understand why they thought this was a good idea. They could have sent troops down the Transib, they could have, I mean, done literally anything except for circumnavigating half of the globe like can't you go through the arctic ocean like just go around like the coast right it's not that frozen up there is it um can't you just go around the north (laughs) i i wouldn't probably not maybe not Um, okay yeah dude they'd hit the they'd hit the uh the uh, i don't know much about the arctic they'd hit the what is it called the uh the the ice wall yeah well yeah (laughs) i don't yeah okay Um, all right (laughs) Oh yeah, just, I'm still open to this whole plan. Actually, now I like about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they sent them. They sent the Baltic fleet. So the Japanese, the Japanese were just waiting for them. Yeah, and they met on the island of Tsushima. Here's the thing: if you're trying to invade Japan, don't try to go through Tsushima. The Mongols tried it and they lost. The Russians tried it. And they're, as we're going to find out, they got smashed. Um, we have a, a picture of what it looked like. <laughs> and 
Yeah. Not fun. Not fun. <laughs> Not very good. Off the coast of China. <laughs> China. <laughs> yeah, that's how we. That's what he says. China. China. Um, <laughs> and also, they woefully, woefully underestimated the Japanese. Literally. The Russian position was, now this is the Russian position. These views are not endorsed by Rearview, Eche Media, Dane, Andy, or Wit. Well, I haven't heard it yet. So, <laughs> um, Basically, what they said was, the Japanese are a bunch of monkeys. We can't lose to Asians. They're Asian. <laughs> and the Japanese were like, uh, we have a Navy too, jackass. <laughs> <laughs> and the Japanese just smoked them. It was such a humiliating defeat. Um, it, it was horrific. I mean, just the whole Baltic fleet, sands a couple of boats, were destroyed. Dang. So that means, effectively, the Russians do not have a navy anymore. Because they lost to, again, their words, a bunch of yellow monkeys. So they're humiliated on the world stage. And, unfortunately, this humiliation bleeds over into russia and the russian people were like what do you mean we lost to japan and so immediately like good traditional um citizens of a kingdom they don't blame the czar but they do blame his advisors and so what begins is in 1905 there is what's known as a revolution it really was initially a protest. A general strike was called, and there was a protest that was led by a priest who Andy is now going to look oh. up his name. Oh. Because I forgot to write it down. <laughs> and also, if Andy could cut this out, that would be uh, awesome. I don't know if I'm going to do that. 1905. Yeah. Priest. It is... That guy? No, maybe. Father Gapon? Yes, Father Gapon. Yeah, that's him. Um, Father Gapon was going to lead a rally against... Uh, it's 1905 or 1906, depending on which calendar you use, <laughs> because the Russians were still on the Julian calendar. Nice. Um, so... <laughs> classic so yeah and that's going to come in later it's the february slash march revolution and the october slash november revolution because oh, that's yeah that's because right. it depends yeah. on which calendar you look at yeah for the purposes of rear view it's all on the julian and their christmas is like july 15th and that's not true but <laughs> it's not true they did show up to the olympics late one year <laughs> they showed up two weeks late because they were on the julian calendar um it's dude it is 1905 <laughs> just use the gregorian i know that a pope invented it just, just come on russia do better um and so father gapon leads this rally and as you'll see in this picture here they're carrying icons they're literally going to pray for the czar and they're like look we're not saying the czar is bad, because again, you got to keep in mind the Okranka is still a thing. Mm -hmm. So they're like, no, the czar is great. Our problem is with his advisors. And we're going to pray for the czar that the Holy Spirit guide him to make mm -hmm. good decisions for our country, which is kind of a passive aggressive way of saying he's not doing a good job. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, this day will ultimately be known as Bloody Sunday, because troops are sent out to disperse the crowd one thing leads to another and they just massacre them. They just start shooting into the crowd. Dang. And again, this was led by a priest. Like this wasn't, this wasn't the Bolsheviks. This wasn't some other socialist group. This wasn't Republicans. It was led by an Orthodox, a literal capital O Russian Orthodox priest. Um, Is and he a saint now? I don't think so. Okay. Um, but yeah, they got massacred. Uh, by the troops that were deployed. And look, if the czar was already unpopular, this was, I mean, this was horrific. And more strikes happen. Famously, the battleship Potemkin mutinies, and they, um, 
you know, the crew takes over the ship. They have to deploy another, sh- you know, multiple ships to take down that ship. The Bolsheviks would use this in their propaganda as like, oh, the first revolution. Uh, this had nothing to do with workers, anything. It had everything to do with fear of how the things were going. So throughout the rest of the uh, early 1910s, things were a little hot. However, Russia began a program of modernization. They began to build more factories. People got more work. The situation with the serfs got a little bit better as a lot of them moved into cities. However, then you have the problem of overcrowding in cities. But so they're playing a delicate, delicate game and they're really, things are starting to get better. And in 1914, as we all know, assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand at the hands of Serb nationalists. What this created is a massive surge in patriotic further fervor f- <laughs> fervor <laughs> for the russian people in fact they become like so patriotic and so really tied into this like racial narrative of world war one that they rename saint petersburg because berg is the german ending for city so they rename it to petrograd san petrograd um which is a russified form of the name. Hmm. Um, and uh, I like uh, the next picture, I think really sums up what the situation in Russia was like pictured here is Tsar Nicholas II on a horse holding out an icon of Christ as soldiers kneel around him. And he was, he was going to give them his blessing as Tsar to as they went to war this was later in the war but i feel like this image kind of encapsulates what the russians were fighting for they were fighting for their identity as slavs uh which to them is tied in with orthodoxy and dis- not being necessarily members of the european continent being their own thing that's why they fought for serbia they were sticking up for another Slavic nation that wanted independence. And also, they kind of wanted to run it, but that's neither here nor there. Um, that's an awesome picture. Yeah, dude, it's so great. It's one of my favorite pictures ever. Um, I'm going to make that my Facebook banner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck finding Andy on Facebook. Um, but, um, so really, and again, this is another thing that shows Nicholas II's indecision. He didn't really know if they should go to war for little Serbia, but all of his advisors were like, you have to, we need to prove they, they were basically trying to redeem, redeem themselves for 1905 and the, and massive failures in Japan. And also they, people were starting to see the writing on the walls that these dynasties might not last as long as they thought. Mm. Um, so immediately in 1914, the Russians invade Northern Austria and Eastern Prussia initially to tremendous success. They're just steamrolling everybody. One of the uh, German generals in Eastern Prussia has like a full breakdown and he's like, Oh, there's Russians everywhere. (laughs) And like, so he's sacked and to replace him are these two men, Paul von Hindenburg and Eric Ludendorff. They have been in every single episode. Our favorite vacay guys. Yes. <laughs> um, because they, I mean, they really are the pillars of this war for Germany. Their Hindenburg is brought out of retirement. Uh, Ludendorff is shipped, shifted from the Western front to the Eastern front. And basically their command is simple. Stop the German advance. Now they meet at they meet the russians in a field in the woods near a town called tannenberg um and this is the first major battle of world war one uh it's it's happening around the same time as the rape of belgium which wasn't really a rape and wasn't really a battle it was more just the russian or the germans just kept pushing and the belgians fought valiantly and fought bravely but ultimately were unsuccessful this is the first major pitched battle of the war Mm. um and we have a great painting of it here and i think this really shows how old this war is i mean you've got guys riding in cossacks riding in with lances 
You know, this is a old wow. school war. I mean, a mm. Khan fought on the Eastern Front. Hussars fought on the Eastern Front. I mean, this is like the war of the old world right here. And unfortunately for the Russians, Ludendorff and Hindenburg just crush them at Tannenberg. And that's mostly because the Russians... I don't know if they didn't know that you should probably encrypt telegrams or if they just assumed nobody but Russians could speak Russian, but they were just <laughs> sending telegrams to each other with explicit details about where they were going, what they were going to do, what their plans are. And most notably, um, after a little skirmish <laughs> on the body of a dead officer, they found the entire Russian plan the Germans found the entire Russian plan for the Eastern offensive. So they knew exactly where the Russians were going to go. They knew how they were going to do it. And most importantly, they knew how many men they had, mm. which was not as many as they thought. Yeah. That's not a good thing. <laughs> that's not a good thing. So the Germans stopped the Russians completely at Tannenberg over a hundred thousand Russians are taken prisoner. And interestingly enough, Tannenberg was also the site of a battle in the 14th century. Hmm. This one, uh, we have a painting of it here. However, it was a battle between the po uh, between Poland, the kingdom of, I believe at the time it was Poland and Lithuania, and the Teutonic Knights. And in the old battle of Tannenberg, the Slavs won. In the new battle of Tannenberg, the Teutons won. And it very much... Like, this wasn't, like, something people realized afterwards. The Germans were like, you know, revenge at Tannenberg. You know, they, it was a massive PR victory. They were going to bury the Slavs. Um, and they really did. While they didn't face that many casualties, over 100,000 taken prisoner is massive. And also, all their stuff. Because the Russians did not have a lot of stuff. Uh, we actually have a picture of all the prisoners here. I mean, look at that. All those cannons, all those men, all of them just handed over to Germany. And that's pretty much the best that the Russians did in this front. They pushed all the way to Eastern Prussia. They pushed the Austro-Hungarians. I mean, you might have to bleep this, but they were just bitch slapping the Austro-Hungarians. The army of Austria-Hungary was a joke. It was not unified at all. Like I mentioned earlier, they had, or in a previous episode, they had to post commands in eight different languages. Your army won't be able to operate like that. And also, this is a time of surging nationalism. So you've got a bunch of Croats, like, or Croats, I still don't know how to say it. Um, they're like, why am I fighting for Austria Hungary? I don't care. And most notably, Czechs and Poles, who were like, I freaking hate the Austrians and the Hungarians. Why am I fighting for them? So Austria-Hungary is getting wiped into 1915. And they reach out uh, to um, Germany. And they're like, please, 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 please help us. Um, because again, the Russians are thinking, this is easy. Beat Austria-Hungary, war is over. Our wars between Austria, Hungary, and their Germany and their ally Germany. However, they again grossly, you know, they they just completely underestimated the Germans because they were like, oh, they're fighting a two front war. We're gonna steamroll them. However, the big thing was that every single Russian soldier had a gun. Not every Russian, or excuse me, every single German soldier had a gun. Not every Russian soldier had a gun. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. On October 9th of 1914, a combined German, Austrian, and Bulgarian force pushes into Serbia. And it is an absolute massacre. I mean, it, it's very interesting because this wasn't really brought up at the Treaty of Versailles. You could absolutely have tried the Austrians for war crimes. Um, I didn't include the pictures here because I thought they were a little too violent. But, I mean, you can find them online of just Austrian soldiers just posing with 
Serbians hanging from trees. I mean, because to the Austrians, they were going to exact revenge on Serbia. And they were very open and honest about it. We talked about their policy of open season on the Serbs in a previous episode. Um, But really, I mean, the Eastern Front is really a racial war. I mean, it is very clearly Germanic peoples versus Slavic peoples. And the Germanic peoples and the Magyars trying to crush the Slavs. Mm. Um, And it's really bloody and really bad. Um, The Serbs are almost completely wiped out. And the Serbian army retreats to Albania. Because nothing bad ever happens in Albania. (laughs) Um, And they're getting picked off in the mountains. I mean, Serbia is basically done after that. Uh, Belgrade falls in December. That's it. Um, Although, ironically enough, they get rewarded at the end of the war. And trust me, we're going to talk about that next episode. (laughs) Um, And by 1915, the Russians are just sustaining too many casualties. And a general retreat is called all the way back to the Russian frontier. Because suddenly the Germans realize, okay, we might not win this war. At the very least, we cannot lose this war. So they're pretty much just trying to hold the line at the Russia, at the Russian borders with Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Bulgaria. Um, Because Bulgaria was welcomed in by the central powers. Um, And this is really where their lack of resources is starting to become apparent. Most notably, artillery shells. They don't have nearly enough. And rifles. They are just running out of rifles. Because as all these men get captured, the Germans take all their crap. And, I mean, the Russians are just spending money hand over fist with every single nation that is cool with them. Uh, Interestingly enough, Winchester and Remington, the United States arms manufacturers, begin to manufacture uh, weapons and munitions for russia they're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars which at the time was billions essentially especially with the state the financial situation in russia which has never been good (laughs) never has there been a czar who's been like no the coffers are looking pretty full we're doing pretty good guys no that's never been the case very opulent the romanov family is gigantic they're paying for everybody it's a disaster so even if the czars themselves aren't spending a lot of money the crown is spending a lot of money um and also so they're spending all this money because they're purchasing all these goods however remington and winchester are really kind of slow rolling their production because they're selling to England and France as well. So they're like, okay, focus on the Western Front. That's who needs it. Meanwhile, the Russians are like, please send us more shells. Um, And also, the command of the Russian military kept changing hands. It was like a game of hot potato. Because the Tsar was like, I can't make any decisions on my own. You take it. And his war ministers were like, well, you're the Tsar. You take it. Um, The Tsar ultimately goes out um a cut like about 50 miles from the front to try to rally the troops uh that's where that famous icon picture comes from um but by 1916 the casualties are just mounting up shipments are coming in way too late and so the russians try in a last gasp they try what's known as the burislav offensive they were just going to push and they were going to keep pushing And, um, it just fails. They were just sustaining too many casualties. Too many men were dying or getting wounded. Um, they didn't really have a good way to combat gas. Some people had gas masks, but not everybody. I mean, it was hard enough on the Western front to get masks. You think the Russians are going to produce masks? They can't even produce enough guns, dude. Like, and they wouldn't shave their beards. No, they couldn't get a good seal. Yeah. Um, But before the Bereslav Offensive, we actually have a video of what the Cossacks went through before they left. And this is based and gold-pilled. This one? Yes. Um, It's silent. Uh, So for our audio listeners, we have a bunch of Cossacks uh, Mm. kissing icons and being blessed. 
um, getting ready to go to war. I mean, like, look at this, like this stuff like this was not happening on the Western front. Um, this is very distinctly Russian. The Russians to this day, still, some of them get blessed before they go into battle. Uh, famously, there was a Orthodox priest who would bless, uh, Russian fighter jets that were doing bombing runs mm-hmm. on ISIS. Wow. Um, but yeah, very, I mean, this is essentially for them a religious war because they're fighting Catholic Austrians and Protestant Germans. And their, you know, orthodoxy stands in the middle. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, a relic of a bygone time. Uh, huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, really, really cool. Um, really, really facile. <laughs> huh. Can you skip ahead two pictures? Okay, this is what um, the Eastern Front looked like. Um, so as you can see here, they pushed all the way to the red... And then all the way back to the green. Um, but that's by 1918, and we're going to talk about what happened in 1917, and it didn't look good. But also, look at how much bigger this front is than the eastern or yeah. the western front. I mean, the western front was fought over a couple of miles. Uh, this is fought over many, 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 many miles. Yeah. Most of those being Russian miles. Because Russia has always had more land than anybody else. Um, Okay, and that brings us to the very unfortunate year of 1917. Things in Russia, in the homeland, that is, were very, very, very bad. Um, Working conditions were getting worse and worse as they were pushing hard to meet the demands of the war. And really, they were getting nowhere. But hours kept increasing while wages kept decreasing because of inflation. People technically were getting paid more, but that money had less purchasing power. I'm we're, we're living that right now. So I'm sure you all understand that. <laughs> um, and this ultimately leads us to February, the city of Petrograd textile workers who were primarily female went on strike, uh, mostly because they were sick of seeing their sons die them get paid less, their hours get increased, and the war is not progressing. They are quickly followed by a group of steel workers who go on strike. And that's a big deal. Whenever people who make metal go on <laughs> strike, it's not good. Especially at this time, because they needed metal for everything. And so, troops are deployed, they're told to break up the protest, send everybody back to work. The troops were like, hey, we actually agree with them. And they joined the protest instead of crushing it. And you could hear butts in the Kremlin pucker so hard, it created a one on the Richter scale because they knew that they were done for. Man. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's not good. That's not good. That's because think I I just think of the like is they're like well how could the soldiers do that but to make soldiers do that you know it has to be really bad mm-hmm. well and also because lot- they're like we'd rather risk the invasion of the Germans mm-hmm. right well no they still wanted to fight the war oh if, yeah you know but they I'm sure they did what they really wanted was a change in strategy because Gosh. the because Tsar Nicholas II was just far too indecisive. You know, plans were changing on a monthly basis and they just couldn't break the deadlock. Mm -hmm. And the Germans were totally cool with just keeping them pinned down because think about what's going on on the eastern and the western front at the time. The Somme, Verdun, the United States has entered the war. So Germany is completely focused on the west and they're just pummeling the Russians in the east. Mm. I mean, they already crushed Serbia. They just needed to keep Russia from advancing essentially and they would have won the war um and so as this strike turned protest turned full-blown revolution is going on uh the duma which is an assembly that was created in 1905 uh as kind of a concession for bloody sunday they essentially they were a parliament but they didn't really have too much power um Imagine 
the English Parliament at the time of Charles the First um, of England. They could just Charles the yeah Charles the First. They just kept getting dissolved. They didn't even know what they could do because all the power still rested in the czar. So they pretty much existed as like a advisory group, but they were mostly ignored. However, during this revolution, they take full control and they form what's called the provisional government. And they institute uh, Alexander Kerensky um, as their head. And I believe we have, Oh, here's a picture of people in the, sh- in the streets of San Petrograd. Um, it also spread throughout the country. It was not just in Petrograd. It was in Moscow. It was everywhere. Because as soon as people were like, oh, revolution? Okay. (laughs) You know, and pictured here uh, is Alexander Kerensky. Um, He was the first prime minister of the provisional government. Mm. Um, Also doesn't look like a super nice guy. Do you know? He uh, he, he was, oh, compared to who comes after him, he was a joy. Um, Yeah, he was fine. Okay. But interestingly enough, he and Lenin grew up in the same town. They didn't know each other. Lenin was about like five years, I want to say, his senior. Something in the water. Um, They went to the same high school. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. The high school produced um, two revolutionaries. Um, And... uh, so yeah, the Duma is in full control. Tsar Nicholas II is on a train rushing back from the front to Petrograd, and his advisors go, "Look, if you go to Petrograd, you might die. If you abdicate now, we can get your family, and we can take you to the Ural Mountains, and then you can go to England to hang out with your cousin." <laughs> 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 um, I I don't know for sure that that was the case but i'm sure he was like "Mm, uh hello hello georgie it's your cousin nikki (laughs) he just has like a british accent accent. like just nailed yeah well when he talks to wilhelm he has a german accent (laughs) yeah yeah because they're all cousins yeah they're all cousins um and so during this time of unrest the germans go "Ooh, this is perfect and the man pictured here, Arthur Zimmerman, the same guy who sent the Zimmerman telegram, looks to Germany and he goes, look, I've got a great idea. There's this guy in Switzerland. He's a Russian revolutionary. He goes by the name of Vladimir Lenin. Let's send him to further the revolutions in russia because the russian provisional government still was going to fight the war they still wanted to win this war however they knew that the bolsheviks well the communists at this time weren't really big fans of the war so what they do is in a sealed train car they guarantee the safe passage of lenin back to russia lenin goes to russia and immediately starts jockeying for control. Um, and famously, in October, he delivers what is known as the October Manifesto, a famous speech which he gave, pictured here, where he had simple demands. Peace, land, and bread now. That sounds great. Um, however, he's a godless heathen. And Okay, objectivity is about to go right out the window. (laughs) Lenin is just a bourgeois pig, okay? Both of his parents were members of the Russian nobility. He was educated in great schools. He went to a great college. He never wanted for anything a day in his life. Literally, while he was a revolutionary, he would write to his mom and be like, Mommy, give me money, please. And she would give him money. He, he never accomplished anything in his life. And his father was a great educational reformer under Tsar Alexander II. During Tsar Alexander III, the education reform stopped. So he started working harder because it was harder to do his work. And he ended up dying as I mentioned earlier, Lenin's brother is hung for being a subversive. So Lenin just hates 
Russia. Absolutely despises the czars. Most of his family are revolutionaries along with him. And dude, he just is the worst. He's the worst. And also, let's talk about how short-sighted this galaxy brain German idea was. Because Zimmerman, dude, if there's anybody who should be blamed for how things go down in the next century, it's Arthur Zimmerman. He gets the U.S. involved because of the Zimmerman telegram. Wherever that came from, I don't know. The story is that he sent it, so I'm going to say that he sent it. Um, So that gets the U.S. involved, forever shaping U.S. foreign policy. And then he goes, hey, let's send a commie into Russia. Genius. Genius stuff. So short-sighted. Almost as short-sighted as shooting Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Literally, dude, so much of the chaos that happened after this war was avoidable. But people just keep failing. They keep putting their own interests above the interests of the common good. I mean, like, Zimmerman, as far as I know, he was Jewish. Um, So... I don't know how much of a God-fearing man he was at this time. Jewish religion was very much in a decline like it is now. Um, Most Jews were atheistic. But, I mean, you just need to think about the fact. Like, just think about the people of Russia and what he was unleashing on them. He knew damn well. He knew absolutely what he was doing. And it was just freaking foolish. Just so idiotic. I mean, because... The Germans had the war in the bag. The Germans were not in fear of losing. Yeah, the Russians were threatening another offensive. But if they, if the Germans were able to hold their own at the Somme and at Verdun, granted, massive casualties, horrific losses, but the English weren't any closer to winning. The French weren't any closer to winning. The Russians were miles away from winning. I mean, pretty much after Tannenberg, the Eastern Front was over. It was maintenance at that point. Um, if you'll notice, that's the only battle we've talked about. <laughs> I think that goes to show, Yeah, you know, um, well, aside from the fighting in Belgrade and stuff like that, but in terms of the Russian German conflict, that's pretty much all that there is. Mm. And the Burislav offensive, which was a massive failure and ended in even more casualties. So it's not like the Germans were in such a desperate position that they had to do this. No, they just, it was expedient. It was easy. They did it. It was idiotic. And I'm very mad. <laughs> very mad. Excuse you me. Should while, be. Excuse me while I take a G and T break. <laughs> October manifesto. That's why I'm not so mad because I already had my G and T. So. Yeah. <laughs> Peace, <laughs> land, and bread <laughs> now. <sighs> Inside of the communists in Russia, there were two groups. There were the Bolsheviks meaning one of the many, and there were Mensheviks, meaning one of the few. That was a joke, like a literal like tongue-in-cheek joke. Um, the Bolsheviks were the smaller portion of the communists in Russia. They favored armed revolution. The Mensheviks favored taking over the provisional government. And how they thought to do this was the provisional government had set up councils, mostly inside of workplaces, known as Soviets. Um, And so the Mensheviks were like, hey, we'll infiltrate the Soviets and we will convince them to vote for us uh, to the provisional government. (laughs) The Bolsheviks went, aha, we will infiltrate the Mensheviks, which have infiltrated (laughs) the the Soviets, and then we'll take over that way. So it it really was a disagreement between armed versus political revolution and i know that saying something like um moderate communist is kind of like an oxymoron and i know communism's freaking disgusting watch the first episode of rear view communism is cringe it literally opens with a bunch of commies kissing commie (laughs) men kissing each other on the lips if you didn't get the subtext about how i feel about communism then I'm telling you, it's gay, all right? (laughs) Um, 
man, this is going to be the episode that gets me canceled. <laughs> um, you make the commies mad. You make the commies mad. Dude, well, I meant I've said monkey, gay, and retard <laughs> yeah. all in one episode. Um, again, uh, those views that the Russian stated, not endorsed by Rearview Dane. Um, they was, those were the Russians' opinion. I'm allowed to quote Hitler. You do think the communists are gay, though? Oh, absolutely. They're disgusting. Yeah. I mean, they're they're just... Dude, like, <laughs> I know in Christian charity, we're not supposed to equate human beings to beasts. But the commies are a bunch of animals. I mean, all of them. Lenin. It was bourgeois. 100%. Through and through. Both his parents, members of the Russian nobility. Like, it's not like, oh, they were rich. They were literal aristocrats with land. Something that he was advocating people should have. Did he give away a single acre of his land? Absolutely not. Um, Trotsky. Well-educated. Doing great. Stalin was not really a factor, interestingly enough. But what he was, was a thug. He literally would rob banks to get money for the Bolshevik cause. He was an idiot. Because his name means man of steel. He literally, his real name is Joseph Dogashvili, and he changed it to Stalin because he's like, oh, <laughs> man of steel. Oh, oh. If you think I hate Lenin, oh, I hate Stalin. <laughs> I really hate Stalin a lot. Um, but yeah, these guys are just opportunists. They knew that the go- the provisional government was very, very, very weak because there were still Russian czarists. There were people who wanted the czar to be in charge, but the same way the English royal family is in charge, you know, and this is what makes the Russian revolution so complicated is we love to think that it's Bolsheviks on one side and czarists on the other. That is not the case. It was Bolsheviks on one side, and then everyone from Tsarists to moderate communists on the other side. Because the Mensheviks did not like the Bolsheviks. They thought they were way too extreme. Yeah. Like, in a similar way that Al-Qaeda hates ISIS, the Mensheviks hate the Bolsheviks. And I know that that's hard for us to understand, but yes, sometimes bad guys hate other bad guys. Um But yeah, and so this culminates in the October slash November revolution. The Bolsheviks decide they're going to completely take over. And what they do is they storm the Winter Palace. They stage a coup and they say, we control the Winter Palace. Therefore, we're in charge of the government. And the provisional government said, no, you're not. And the Bolsheviks said, too late we moved the capital to moscow (laughs) i mean they really just like took over a building that's all they really did the real fighting doesn't start until the civil war um you know there were some street skirmishes but nothing that you would call battles or organized armies and it's all russian propaganda that it was like the people rising up and taking the winter palace that's complete crap okay it was trotsky and lenin and lenin smuggled himself in because the, I mean, all the streets were locked down. Nobody was allowed. They were looking for the Bolsheviks and Lenin literally pretended to be drunk as he like wandered the streets and the guards were like, ah, oh, it's just a drunk guy. Let him go home. And then he, you know, kind of oh, sneaky, 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 um, pig. Oh, I hate him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so while they are in control, it is now March 3rd of 1918 they signed the treaty of brest litovsk with the germans because in peace land bread now the first item is peace they promised to end the war this was extremely unpopular very unpopular um pictured right here are the delegates from the soviet union Ooh. It's just gross saying, uh, and Germany. And one of the, partly one of the reasons why it was so unpopular was because they gave up pretty much half of Ukraine, which was the breadbasket of Russia. 
they also gave up Poland. They were just giving away land. They just wanted to end the war because mm-hmm. they were like, okay, we're going to make our point. We're going to end the war. And again, most Russians wanted to still fight the war. And interestingly enough, to show that they were um, a party of the people, they just like dragged some peasant along with them. And they were like, hey, come and sit on this peace conference with us. You'll be the voice of the people. And he said, what does that mean? And they said, don't worry about it. Shut up. Yeah. And so the Soviets end the war with Germany. And it's somehow even more humiliating because they just gave up land. They just gave everything away. Essentially, passively, they were like, yeah, it was our fault. We started the war. Which Mm -hmm. the Germans would use this during the Treaty of Versailles to be like, look, the Russians said it was their fault. And unfortunately, there's one loose end that we need to tie up. That being the fate of the Romanov family. Uh, If you're listening to this with your kids, send them away. (laughs) Because I'm going to go into detail. And it's not very nice. Um, the Romanov family retreated, uh, to the Ural mountains, um, an area known as Yekaternenburg, um, near the Ural mountains. Uh, they were in hiding, uh, praying that the Bolsheviks would not find them. They had no fear of the provisional government. They had a lot of fear of the Bolsheviks. Um, and this is kind of how the Bolsheviks like finally assert that they're in control is they do find them and led by a man named Yakov Yurikus Yurus Yuruski. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's very hard. Um, on July 16th, 1917, they found them in their home. The Romanovs were trying to make a quick escape Many of the women infamously sewed jewelry and diamonds into their dresses because they were trying to smuggle out what little items of value they had left. And the Bolsheviks find them. They kill the guards. There's a small firefight. They then take the Russian royal family into the basement, pictured right here. Um, As you can see, bullet holes everywhere. And they brutally murder them. They, they hated the czar and the czarina so much that they just kept shooting them. And because of the diamonds and everything that was in the czarina's dress, they had to shoot her in the head. And they shot her multiple times in the head. And they bayoneted them repeatedly after they were dead. Um, some eyewitness accounts refer to it as like an orgy of blood. Um, famously, some Bolsheviks have occult, um, occult links to them and, uh, a ritual known as the kill the King ritual was performed by them prior to this. And people who were there, servants and the like legitimately thought that they were demons. Um, I mean, just this, the screaming was horrific and, when they realized that the children were still alive, um, they then focused their violence on the children. And something that needs to be kept in mind is that uh, the Tsarevich, Alexei, was a hemophiliac. Um, Some of the daughters had, I believe, I believe, don't quote me, but I believe, had some mild hemophilia. So when they were shot, there was blood everywhere. Um, It was an incredibly gory and bloody affair. Um, Because of the suffering that they went through, um, in the Eastern Church, the the Russian royal family are venerated as passion bearers. Um, We have an icon uh, right here of the Russian royal family. Um, A passion bearer is kind of, I'm grossly oversimplifying it, Um, Rich can come on and explain it again. He explained it in the first episode. Um, But basically what it is, is you suffered in a way 
uh, you participated in the suffering of Christ on the cross. Um, they weren't outright martyrs because they weren't killed specifically for the practice of their religion. However, they were killed by the most evil regime that has ever walked the earth. And you can fight me on that. The Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union that follows them are without a doubt one of the greatest blights in all of human history. And they just slaughtered this family. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I mean, I under I could understand this level in hatred for someone like Ivan the Terrible, who beat his own son to death. Someone like Peter the Great, who also tortured his son to death. I could imagine it for Catherine the Great, who promised reforms and then went in the complete opposite direction. I cannot, for the life of me, understand that level of hatred for a guy who was simply un just he was just simply unfit for the job. He was not evil. A bit naive, absolutely. But he was not an evil man, which leads me to absolutely believe that it was evil that caused his death. And if you don't see the fingerprints of the demonic in the Bolsheviks, you need to pray to have eyes to see because it's there. Literally, they began by destroying a family. As we all know, the family is the base unit of Christian society. Without the family, we don't have anything. A royal family is the model for all families, for better and for worse. And I don't really think there is a better model of Christian fatherhood than Tsar Nicholas II. He didn't have mistresses. He, like Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was committed to his wife and loved his wife, despite all the rumors and slander and hatred and calumny thrown their way. He was very faithful to his life, and he loved his children. Um, he was trying to make Tsarevich Alexei. Tsarevich means son of the Tsar, and it also kind of means that you're the heir apparent. He was trying to make him a better Tsar than he was. And it's just an absolute tragedy, the likes of which the world hadn't really seen before. Um, I mean, because it's very rare, dude, in world history that you see an entire family massacred like that. You know, I mean, famously, the regicide of Charles I, um, palace coups left and right in Byzantium. But really, they were just big fans of blinding people and then sending them to a monastery but do just cold blooded murder in a basement. <sighs> yeah. So that is the Eastern front. It's not quite as on the battlefield, not quite as dramatic as the West, but on the home front is much more dramatic. And I mean, this is the moment where in my mind, the old world dies. Austria-Hungary was a nation on life support by this time. And the Romanovs, I mean, like really the last absolutists in the world, the, la the real last strong royal family. Yes, in Germany, they're the Hollenzarns. Von Hollenzarn? The Kaiser's family. Um... They did not reign for nearly as long as the Romanovs did. And, you know, there's not really any Romanovs left today because the violence did extend to the extended family because czarists were hunting down left and right to try to figure out who the legitimate heir was. But no, it's, it's really funny, you know, because everybody loves to quote T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Men. You know, this is how the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. The old world died with a bang. And then they dragged the body through the streets and burned it in sacrifice on the altar of progressivism and of revolution and of 
I mean, communism is really kind of just liberalism taken to its logical extreme. And this, I mean, the, the Soviets would go on to rule for 70 years and a cold war would happen. I mean, just think about how different the world be, would have been without the Soviet Union. I mean, if Russia had a republic and they continued to fight, who knows how the war would have turned out? Who knows how the world would have turned out? It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's just a tragedy. So on that somber note, uh, thank you all very much for watching. Um, yeah. Nighty night, baby. I love you. <laughs>